uh, uh, Mr. Pure is going to, our principal will talk a little bit, uh, and, and about things we need and why we need them. Uh, and then we're going to have Andrew, which many of you met, from ARG, Architectural Resources Group, we'll talk about the historic pieces. And then we'll have Jim Favaro, who many of you met, who's our architect, who will talk about the projects and what's coming, and then we're going to have some time for you to give us more information along the way. You can be writing more post-its, you can be writing more things on the back of your map if you want to hand them to us, uh, or when you say things, uh, Kelsey will be up here and writing things down. So we'll have lots of ways to capture things that you're saying. Huh. That said, Mr. Fuhrer. Yeah, I'm happy to talk. Um, no, thank you so much. Yeah, talk all day, talk all night. And, uh, welcome everybody to the Grant School. Raise your hand if you are a grandparent. Raise your hand if you were a grandparent. Raise your hand if you were a grandparent and a staff member. <laughs> you got a lot of skin in the game, right? Yeah. Uh, nice to see you all. Thank you uh, for coming uh, from around the community. So I'm going to talk very little, actually. Uh, uh, I think really what we're all here for is to see improvement in our school campuses. We need that improvement. Uh, I'll be very blunt about it. These campuses are very old. Um, there are some parts of our buildings that are uh, falling apart. We have to repair them an awful lot, and they just don't really fit into sort of the way we teach and learn today. Uh, so it's time to upgrade that. But you know that because this community approved the bond measures to actually approve these uh, facilities improvements. So, um, some of the things that I'm excited about, and I don't want to steal thunder from, um, you know, from our architects or anybody else, but some of the things that I'm excited about is, I'll skip this one right now, I'm going to come back to this, so, this is the, yeah. Well, you know, I'm here to share my opinion, right, and, and, and let you know how I feel about some of these projects. I'm in love with a lot of these things. Um, again, not these, we're all our projects. Okay, first of all, the historic garden. Did you all know that this school was built around the 200-year-old trees that are not in this picture? <laughs> this is a rendering issue. I, we did speak uh, with the architects. Uh, the trees actually will be here. The Melaleuca trees, the over 100-year-old trees, they will be here. They're not being torn out. Um, but uh, this, this school was actually, this is not the original site. It was a Virginia park. A lot of you probably know that. They outgrew that. They moved over here to this, this, uh, this plot of land here. And those two trees were in that garden. The building right up here were the main offices, and then the building behind the main offices, those were the only two buildings uh, that they built in the very beginning. They built around that garden. So we call it our historic garden. Uh, teachers use this all of the time. In fact, they sign up to go out there and bring their classes out to collaborate, uh, have reading time, they do reading buddies, but it does need an upgrade. It's, it's a little wild right now. Um, so what they're going to put in here uh, is a hedge between the classrooms uh, and, and the green garden. So there's some outdoor learning space in here. Uh, it'll be a little bit quieter, uh, but we still get the indoor-outdoor um, effect for the people in the classrooms. On this side of it over here, you can see that it's more like a park-like setting. There'll be some decomposed granite over here, so it doesn't always get muddy and, uh, and kind of messy. Uh, and then you, of course, have what we call the second grade um, building. Right okay. now, the kids come out of that and come into the um, courtyard often as well. Um, what you see at the end here is this big glass wall. And this is this building right here. This entire building is going to be gutted and turned into a beautiful modern library media facility. Um, this glass wall will lead right out into the historic garden. So, what we've been trying to do is, and definitely during COVID, is that we, uh, when we came back last spring, brought kids back on campus, was to have them be inside and outside the classrooms. But we really inspired them to be outside the classrooms, mostly for the fresh air, spacing, and all of that. We would like to continue with that model. We want kids to be outside and learning in various learning spaces, outdoor learning spaces. Um, which leads me to this project, and we're going to talk about that right now. Um, the other projects over here, so I'm excited about the garden, but it's, it's more of a minor project though, right? That's an easy one. The library media center, definitely the library needs an upgrade. Now, we at Grant, we love our library. We love our librarian, <laughs> Petra. We have the best librarian in the district. Um, but we love our library, but we also know that it needs some modernization. Big time. We, again, teaching and learning is different than when this building was put up in 1965. Not, not too historic, by the way, the 1965 building. Um, 
But uh, we need wide open spaces. We need the ability to move walls, have you know, glass walls move. We need multiple rooms so uh, classes can come in and collaborate. Um, we need spaces where we can have multiple classrooms together uh, for presentations. Um, this design here, and whether it turns out exactly like this, these are, uh, what do we call these? Um, design rendering. renderings, right? Yeah. Not technical specs, it could change a little bit, but I do really love this, uh, the way that they opened all this up. Um, the, the Right here, these courtyards, here we go. Right here, right now, the courtyards are, uh, really they're like little wastelands, right? They serve their purpose for certain things for us. Right now we're doing COVID testing in this one. The other one is our outdoor cafe for, um, you know, for eating during lunchtime because we needed more space when we brought kids back, uh, you know, because of COVID. These are gonna be turned into these beautiful little courtyards, trees, sitting areas, um, with all of these glass walls that lead into the library media center. And you can see from this rendering that it actually goes from this little courtyard right here all the way straight through to the cafeteria area, right? Again, just opening it up, making it nice and, and uh, light, uh, and, and giving us beautiful spaces for our students to learn. Um, and then, you know, I'm not gonna go through all these and what you can do, but these glass walls right here, this is actually the kindergarten classroom, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Another great project is moving all the early learning over to the building up front here. So, uh, Ms. Thomas, you know, uh, the front building uh, also don't think is historic. Um, no, it's not. It was put in, I read, I did read the report, it was a fascinating report. Uh, but that building um, would, uh, we're moving up pre-K and TK. And again, I think you probably heard that TK is expanding. Universal pre-K, I think we're calling it. Universal TK. Universal TK? Yes. Not pre-K? Not your T. No. Okay. We're moving everything up front uh, and to be with kindergarten. So we're putting all of the early learning together, which makes a lot of sense. Part of the plan also is to take part of that front yard of the school and, uh, and, and, and close that so that we expand the outdoor uh, recreation space for the students. But it's not just outdoor recreation space, it's outdoor learning space too. So again, if we go along with what these renderings say and the plans, uh, these glass walls will open up somehow and kids will be able to uh, learn outside and inside. So again, there'll be a nice flow, the classrooms will be nice and bright. Uh, I'm very excited about that project too. Let me talk really quickly about, are you standing in that, are you blocking me on this one? <laughs> I just, because, you know, the only reason I want to talk about it is because they have a board. They, there's a board here. And so, uh, I really love this project right here. Now, this has not been an approved project yet, and I will continue to work on the district. We have a very open conversation about it often. I tell everyone how much I love this uh, for this school. And I think this, this, school, this school, this community, these kids deserve a project like this. Okay? They deserve a building like this uh, to replace the bungalows. What would happen is we have this building right here would go where that, that beautiful playground structure is by the nice big old tree that drops all those millions of berries every year um, and the learning garden. All of that would be, not the tree, the tree would stay, but everything else would be moved. Uh, and this building would be built. It's a single story building, so you uh, remove the bungalows of those classrooms or we change the configuration where people are. Uh, but uh, you put them in this building here, it may not look exactly like this. The second story of the building, however, is this wonderful, beautiful, large, uh, uh, very spacious learning garden up top. So the learning garden you see down here would be no more. It would be on top of this building. So we would have STEM or STEAM, uh, activities going on up here. We'd have the learning garden. Um, it would be right in front of this, uh, the historic building that was one of the two original buildings, uh, separated by a hedge wall that's about this high, so that you have some privacy between these classrooms right here, this new building, and then these classrooms right here. And again, there's a free flow uh, going between the inside and the outside. So these are very exciting projects. I'm hoping that we can get all of these done because again, uh, the way we teach and learn right now is different than the way these buildings were built. Okay, it's time to upgrade. Uh, and so I appreciate that this community approved those bonds. Uh, so now we just need to continue to move forward and get this done for our kids. I was talking to a parent outside who has a little one uh, in kindergarten right now. And I think that that child is gonna actually see some of this 
done over the next few years. They will enjoy those, those facilities. But remember that you are a resident in this neighborhood probably, or at least in this city, but those of you that live in this neighborhood, even if your kids are not here anymore, you want these projects to be completed because this is about your community and your property values, right? You want good, safe schools, modern schools, you want to bring people in, and particularly since enrollment is going down across the state, we want to continue to draw people into our schools in Santa Monica. So, um, I'm happy to, uh, this is not a question and answer thing, this is just to be talking. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, anyway, I'm very, I'm very excited about all these projects. I want to keep doing more. Unfortunately, they unleashed the beast, right? They brought in architects. And like, let's, let's have a charrette. Let's talk about you know, design and what we can do. And the, and the answer is we can do an awful lot. We have big imaginations here. We have a wonderful teaching staff and support staff that have a lot of great ideas about how we can improve our facilities. So we want to keep moving forward on this. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, so just, just to start off, just to mention some of the things we've done. We did a, a initial security uh, upgrade to the front. We've done our window paint floor door uh, modernization project. We put in new heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. We're just finishing up that electric, that, that project with fire alarm and accessibility. You might also notice other people are around. They're working on that, but they're also working on putting in our new bell clock and PA system, uh, which is a safety and security measure. We also just redid the front gate because when we did the front gate back in the BB project, sadly that was before a Sandy Hook experience. So we had to adapt, and so we've adapted to create even a better security. But those projects are moving forward. We have a lot of stuff in process. But Andrew, would you please come and tell us about the historic resources uh, reports? So Andrew from Architectural Resource Group. Anywhere you want. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Goodrich with ARG. Um, we are a historic preservation consulting firm, and we have been the district's uh, historic consultant throughout this process. I'm um, really happy to be here tonight, um, and really uh, just wanted to walk through the historic resources inventory, or HRI, that was prepared for the Grand Campus. So um, our work is really driven by policies that were implemented by the district back in February of 2021, um, specifically board policy and administrative regulation 7113. Um, these policies call upon the district, and I'm quoting here, to identify and clarify treatment of historical resources present on properties under its jurisdiction. Um, so that, that said, the big picture goal of our work is really twofold. Um, first, it's to identify what the historical resources on um, the camps are. And then second is to integrate the consideration of historical resources into uh, future planning of the grant campus moving forward, uh, really with the understanding that the campus will need to evolve and adapt um, to a degree to meet the needs of a 21st century institution. So um, this is just a quick summary of the approach that we took as we prepared the HRI. Uh, we began by reviewing existing documentation um, and participating in a community meeting. This was held on um, in June of 2021 via Zoom. Many of you may have been there. Um, from there, we conducted background research and context developed, or developed to start context, um, both for the district as a whole, but really specifically for this campus. Uh, we conducted a field inspection in which a team of historians from our office um, walked the campus. We observed every building, every site feature, um, really to get a sense of what's on the ground and to see it and experience it with our own two eyes. Um, and then from there, we compiled everything into a historical reason. I think my, oh, there it goes. All right, sorry about that. Um, we compiled everything into a historical resources inventory report, um, the HRI, throw an acronym at you. Um, and then this just includes, it includes a history of the campus and assessment of its historical resources. Um, so, so to understand how we arrived at our conclusions, it's important to have a baseline understanding of the campus and its history. Um, so as, as many of you probably know, the original Grant School was actually not at this location. It was um, several blocks to the north, where Virginia Avenue Park is located today. Um, this building was constructed in 1905. Um, it's uh, kind of pictured at the top there. It was a traditional brick schoolhouse. Um, 
However, in uh, 1933, this building was pretty extensively damaged um, in the Long Beach earthquake. Um, the district was also grappling with overcrowding issues at this school. So um, instead of uh, investing in the reconstruction of this existing building, the decision was made to uh, move the entire campus several blocks south and start new, which is how we arrived here at Hitsetse Park. Um, so the first buildings uh, completed on campus, they were built in 1936. They were designed by the architectural firm of Parkinson and Parkinson. These are very significant uh, regional architects in Los Angeles. Um, additions were made to the campus uh, several times after that in 1940, 45, 54, and 65. Um, and then in more recent years, uh, modular and portable buildings, or the bungalows, uh, were added to accommodate additional growth. So, um, the development of the campus, there, there really boils down to two major phases. The first day, phase dates to 1936. Um, the second phase dates to um, the additions that were made in the 1940s, between 1940 and 1945. Um, these buildings and um, their associated landscape features really create um, what, what we call the historic core of this campus. They're, um, they're, they're all pretty architecturally similar, they're um, cohesive, and they really collectively form a sense of place. Um, other buildings uh, were added later, so this includes Building A at the front of the campus, uh, Building F, which is kind of right behind us um, to your right, and then um, uh, in addition to Building B along the western perimeter of the campus. These um, were added later, they deviated from kind of the original architecture and, and plan for the school, so um, they, they really read as uh, later additions compared to the original buildings. So it might be a little easier for me to um, just show this graphically to give you a sense um, kind of of where these, these things lie on the campus. So bear with me a minute. So these buildings in blue here, um, these are the original campus buildings from 1936. This is building C and D, as well as the courtyard between them. In 1940, you have um, buildings B and G, and then in 45, buildings E, H, and K. These are kind of the, it's hard to see here, but these are the lighter blue. So this, these collectively form um, what we refer to as the historic core of the campus. Um, later developments came in the 1950s and 60s, well into the post-war period. So this includes building A, um, in addition to building B, and then building F. And these are represented by that kind of hashed red line there. These um, are not historical resources um, because they, they really don't um, have a meaningful connection with the rest of the campus. Um, so because they consist of multiple buildings and site features, school campuses are often looked at through the lens of a historic district. Um, so what is a historic district? This language, just real briefly, comes from the National Park Service. Um, and the definition, and I'm quoting here, a district possesses a significant concentration, linkage, or continuity of sites, buildings, structures, or objects, united historically or aesthetically by plan or physical development. So um, kind of in, in normal terms, um, this just means that there needs to be a meaningful relationship between buildings and site features in such a way that they come together to create a unified whole. So um, we, we applied this guidance, this definition to the Grant Campus. And um, in our um, analysis, in our professional opinion, um, there, there does appear to be a historic district present at this campus. Um, this does not include the entire campus, rather it is confined to the area, um, the, the buildings and the central courtyard that collectively form uh, what, I, what I called its historic core. Um, the district was found to be eligible um, for listing in the California Register, this is the state inventory of historical resources, as well as um, the local inventory of historical resources for reasons I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more in just a minute. Um, and and I, I should really emphasize that just because um, something is eligible for listing doesn't automatically designate it as such. Um, that is a completely separate process. We're just um, looking at the potential eligibility of these resources for future planning purposes. Um, so the district is significant, the historic district is significant really for two reasons. Um, first, it's a very tangible expression of school modernization efforts. Um, that the district undertook in the, the Depression and World War II eras. Um, this is a very important period of, of history for the district, um, wherein uh, the district allocated a, a considerable, 
excuse me, a considerable amount of capital and resources um, toward modernizing and improving its facilities. Um, second, the um, district is significant as a good example of the PWA modern style of architecture. This is um, the architectural vocabulary that's commonly associated with the Depression era, uh, 1930s and 40s. Um, it's also significant as a notable work of master architects Parkinson and Parkinson and Joe Estep. Um, the Parkinson's and Estep often worked in collaboration um, and among their notable buildings include Santa Monica City Hall in addition to this campus. Um, so the district is assigned what's called a period of significance. Um, in historic preservation language, this just means the period during which it assumed its historic character. So um, the period of significance for this uh, the historic district on the Grant campus was identified as 1936 to 1945. Um, these are just some images of contributing buildings. Um, they're a little hard to see, so I apologize about that. But um, you, you can see that they, they really um, all ascribe to the same architectural language. Um, they have a lot of similar features that are replicated um, kind of across buildings and across the campus. Um, and as I mentioned, that courtyard, it's kind of that the center at the very bottom was identified as a contributing feature of the historic district as well. And then um, I just wanted to close with um, kind of discussing next steps. So really this is the first part of our work is identifying what the historic resources on campus are. And that's what's represented in the historic resources inventory, the HRI that was prepared. Um, moving forward, the district will be utilizing the HRI findings to inform the future planning, design, and environmental review as it relates to the campus. And we will be working uh, with the district and um, their design team and their architects um, really to, to ensure that historical resources um, are incorporated into future planning efforts at the campus uh, to the greatest extent feasible. Um, that concludes my presentation. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. And just to say that the uh, historic resource report, if you want to look at it, it's at the uh, facility improvement page uh, at the district website. Uh, if you ever have a challenge finding. Now, Mr. Favaro, our architect, will tell us more. Thank you very much. Brought forward to the Board of Education, and then they currently funded projects that will take place within the next three years. Um, I did want to uh, just uh, point out that there are a array of considerations that we issue surrogates in this planning and design uh, process. Always have to keep in mind and to bring into alignment. Everyone has their interests in terms of improving the quality of the overall outcome, but we have to balance all of them. I'll just emphasize the first one, which is that everything we're doing is being driven by the education master plan that was developed by administrators and educators and approved by the Board of Education in 2019. Went through their committee structure and they were fully aware of it. And this is the only document that we had at our disposal to actually guide how we would formulate uh, any kind of master plan going forward. And the last one, fiscal responsibility, doesn't mean being cheap stuff. It means actually being smart about how you invest dollars in, in the pursuit of excellence, not extravagance, but excellence, and that whatever you invest in doesn't get in the way of what you do next. So that's why you plan for things and why you embrace the long term first and then work backwards from there based on priorities and what you actually want to implement. Thus creating ultimately a sum of parts that's greater than the whole as we build it into a plan incrementally over time. This is the existing campus as you've seen before uh, with 24th Street to the right and Pearl Street to the left, the alley running along uh, both sides, uh, along the sides of the campus. Um, in purple are six portable classrooms along the uh, Pearl Place, and then four modular classrooms along 24th Street. It is the direction of the Board of Education to ultimately replace all of those portable and modular classrooms on campus in permanent facilities. The historic district that was just discussed, I'll just point out that the building that what is defined as the proposed historic district was set back from Pearl Street, but one wing of the building along Pearl Street was not part of the original uh, founding of, of the school. 
There are three projects that are currently funded, as Kristen very well described, which are the Central Garden, uh, relocating pre-K from the back of campus to the front of campus, associated with kindergarten, more easily with dropped off by parents at the front of campus, and the rehabilitation at Central Garden. I'll describe those in a little more detail in a minute. But first, um, way more significantly are the unfunded projects which would come next, uh, which is basically to remove all of the barnacles that have accumulated around the historic core over the last 50 years. All the larger classrooms, the oddly shaped field, uh, ad hoc located uh, location of parking and, and whatnot over the time. So quite a bit on the south campus and then a little bit on uh, Pearl Street and on the Pearl Street frontage. At which point we will then build uh, two buildings, one being a single story, six classroom building. Six classrooms because we had hoped that we'd be able to get this building under the cut for SMS funding. It would have replaced the six portables that are currently located along the alley. And for other reasons, it's one story which I'll describe. Uh, it did not make the cut, so it is in phase two. And then uh, alongside of that would be, uh, once the portables are done, we'd be able to then shift kindergarten back, add three TK classrooms, as is going to be required, uh, and then on the second floor, add seven classrooms for upper elementary. The reasons for the numbers of classrooms, I'll, do, I'll explain uh, in a minute also. Um, and then on the south side of campus, shifting the field to the center so that it's more easily integrated into the daily life of students. Also, secondarily forms a much better frontage along the 24th Street neighborhood that dead ends into it. And then putting parking on either side of it uh, so staff and faculty will be able to approach from 24th Street or the alley, either alley. That's to, to be determined in the future. Uh, and parking on areas that are currently difficult to supervise. So the sort of back 40 is with Dry's Christian kind of crazy, and so uh, we figured that's more appropriately uh, accommodating the parking. And then if you choose, we'll have enough classrooms to be able to remove that front wing and uh, restore the setback that was originally there, but in this case, perhaps providing for a um, pick up and drop off arrival cord and some guest parking. So as you can see, most of the new construction, not all of it, but most of it does occur outside of the historic, uh, the proposed historic uh, district. So just repeat that sequence in three dimensions. 24th Street uh, in the lower left, Pearl Street in the upper right, the front of the school in the upper right. The three renovation projects, Central Garden, Library Expansion, Renovation, Early Education, Relocation to the front wing of school. What the school would uh, essentially be like for about three to five years, uh, waiting for phase two funding. Um, with the funding, uh, we would then achieve the one-story building that creates the frontage onto the playground areas, the fields and whatnot essentially terminates that view along 24th Street neighborhood with what we'll read essentially as a new, another front um, to, the, to the campus. And then along the side, uh, on the west side, is the two-story uh, <coughs> early education and upper elementary classroom building. And then you can see along Pearl Street the setback there that's restored. In this case, uh, it'll be landscaped and whatnot, but it is primarily used to get cars off of the neighborhood streets for pickup and drop off. And what the campus would then look like, uh, probably for a generation after the completion of phase two. So what you see there in the center is that rooftop terrace that um, <coughs> Christian had referred to. Uh, it's fairly precisely calibrated in terms of its location vertically and horizontally. Since there is instruction occurring up there, children and adults and whatnot, we will be bringing stairs and elevators, obviously, to the second floor, hence the over the uh, porch-like structure along the front there. And it is set off the second grade, second grade classroom wing, the one that currently faces onto the playground by about 30 feet, which will be cleaved into two halves, 15 feet on each side of a five or six foot high edge wall to provide for outdoor classroom space 
serving the second great wing and the new wing. Uh, in the case of the new wing, as you can kind of see hinted at there, um, are vertically retracting glass doors that will allow those classrooms to open completely out to the outdoor classrooms. So the other reason for wanting to do a one-story building here is to have a better relationship with the historic core, so there is an kind of immediate two-story jump right off of the second classroom wing, but also because that's the south side of campus, we're allowing, uh, preserving the sunlight coming down into the uh, outdoor educator, outdoor classrooms, as well as into the second grade classrooms, as well as into the historic core. So this is what you're seeing now from the other side of Pearl Street now in the front. And the arrival court is sized so that you could arrive, uh, essentially you would enter here, and we had the full length of the front of campus to then exit here to get all our pick up and drop off. And then there are parking spaces there for early ed parents uh, to be able to walk their children into classes, which will be essentially right here. So fairly close to the front of school. So just to be clear, this is the historic garden here, secondary classroom wing. The gap between um, the one-story building and the new building in phase two, the two outdoor education zones here, the rooftop uh, garden there, playground area, the big giant trees right about there, playground area now consolidated and, uh, and more integrated into the center of campus, the field at the end, the two parking lots on the other side. So the education specifications that emerge from the master plan are, simply put, just rooms. That's all they are, they're just room diagrams. So <clears throat> faculty and administration comes together to decide, well, how is pedagogy changing and what are the facilities that we need to facilitate that? Currently, facilities are not facilitating that, they're getting in the way of it. And so when we talk about expansion of the, of the, of the school buildings, it's not due to expanding due to enrollment. There is a target of 680. The school used to be at 680. It's currently less than what it is now, less than 500. 550. Yeah. Um, that target is just set so that the, the Board of Education knows what the capacity of the campus is. But the main reason why it's expanding so much is that rooms are just much, much bigger than the new pedagogical model. And by the way, this isn't unique to this district. This is being adopted across the country. We're a little bit actually behind the game. We're already a quarter way through the 21st century. Uh, so, for example, every room was, um, has been uh, documented very precisely, including general purpose, special purpose, and all of the all-school uh, facilities, multi-purpose, uh, auditorium, cafe, whatnot. The auditorium, for example, is specified to be two and a half sizes of this room. We're not addressing that now. We have to take care of classrooms first. Uh, and on the subject of the classrooms, what's happening is pre-K and kindergarten staying more or less where they are, but first and second grade and third through fifth grade are increasing quite a bit in terms of size. If you compare with where classrooms were in the 1940s when this building was built, it's just a completely different teaching model. So there's not rows of kids being seen and not heard, just absorbing information and then taking tests. This is project-based, activity-based, self-initiated. They need lots of room for those kinds of collaborations. So if you compare the classrooms now, let's just take 10 around the historic core at about 820 to 880 square feet. You can see that they're quite a bit smaller than what's required for lower elementary at 1270 and for upper elementary at 1400. And were we to attempt to increase the classroom sizes, which I wouldn't particularly recommend, but were we to do that, we'd end up with very narrow, very long classrooms, as you can see in the lower right, essentially a kind of bowling alley type of, of classroom. Um, and you would reduce the number of classrooms from 10 to 4 in the areas that, I, that we're using as an example. So if you went from 10 to 4, you'd be losing 4. If we want to replace six modulars and uh, six portables and four modulars, that's 14, but we're down now. And if we take away the front wing of the building, that's another four, we are down 18 classrooms uh, 
in order to then replace those, we need to build more classrooms outside of the uh, perimeter of the existing building. So it's, again, not at all about increasing student enrollment. It's about aligning your facilities with your pedagogic objectives. First of the three, SMS funded project is quite modest and very delicate. Actually, it's not an easy project. It's just modest in scope, and that is to restore that central garden. Uh, and it essentially consists of really two parts on the right as Christian described, as preservation of those uh, ancient trees and making them more integrated with the life of the student with proper ground treatment around them. We're not sure exactly how to do that yet, but we do want to make it usable uh, and, and also uh, beautiful and not beat up all the time with tables and chairs and whatnot for students to come every day. A healthy lawn through the middle of the space, and on the left, again, a hedge wall that was able to then demarcate the outdoor classroom for <clears throat> first grade wing, so that, again, they're not distracted by activity that's occurring in the central garden or vice versa. And what you're seeing in the view as you're looking uh, east is into the library at the back. So beyond is the library um, itself which I'll describe now. So we were just standing at this end of the garden here looking down the long dimension of it towards what will become the new library. Uh, and the second project is to, as Christian mentioned, is to re relocate early education from the back of the campus to the front of campus so that early ed and kindergarten are now unified. Uh, in order to do that, we are taking four classrooms and transforming them into three classrooms. Which I'll describe a little bit. So we're demolishing three partition walls inside of the building. Between each classroom, building the required support space, restrooms, obviously for little kids, uh, workroom, storage, opening those classrooms to what is currently the front lawn, which will be pitched in, so that those can um, operate as play yard for those. And that's all uh, legally mandated by the state very particular about square footage that you have to assign to each child uh, in the TK age group, including exterior playground that has to be adjacent to the classroom. Uh, this is a, an early visualization of what those classrooms would look like. Again, with the vertically retracting doors, the um, kind of contigu contiguous relationship of indoor space and outdoor space along that frontage. And finally, the most uh, significant project that, in my opinion, will have actually a transformation impact on the life of this campus. It's pretty amazing what will happen here. <clears throat> so this is a diagram of the existing condition. To the right is the central garden, to the left is the alley, the multi-purpose room above, the auditorium below. The courtyard that we see out the window is this space right here. So right now, this is the library proper that you see in that wing that was built later. And the rest of it is this um, kind of old school computer lab and a bunch of literary stuff that will move to where pre-K is now once they move up, up front in order to then liberate all of that space. So we will be expanding the library into that whole L shape Side facing onto the historic garden, and in this little corner right here, doing a little modest addition to kind of clean up the shaping of that area there. We're not going to really mess around with the back of the house up on the upper left, uh, but we will be moving the circulation desk out. And we'll end up with essentially a U shaped uh, library that will be surrounding uh, open spaces, now useful open spaces, not abandoned ones, but useful ones with landscape and trees and whatnot. In there. Again, a completely contiguous relationship between the inside and the outside. So, the library will open out to the historic garden on the right. It will open out to the left to another outdoor classroom uh, that I'll describe in a minute. Uh, it will open out on all three sides of the U shape into that space there, and it'll open out to the space that's between the NPR and the library. This is a view just about standing right here now, looking towards the NPR with the U-shape wrapping this room. You're looking through the library to the next courtyard and into the NPR and beyond. 
So we will be taking down all of the walls in that leg of the, of the U. We will be moving circulation desk out to where um, he or she can survey the entirety of the facility. Um, you cannot see these colors very well, but on the right uh, will be upper elementary reader seats. In the middle of that wing opposite is a, a full-on makerspace classroom um, for 36 students. Uh, with adjacent outdoor classroom space. Above that is a project room for any number of activities, either associated with the makerspace or not, has a separate entrance. Below is a uh, workroom and storage areas to support the makerspace. To the right is early education room, which is uh, visible but acoustically sealed from the rest of the library for story time and other activities to, to take place. And then the upper right is collections, uh, and adjacent to that is um, the lower elementary reader seats uh, more closely located to the circulation pass. So this is a view with your back to the historic garden looking essentially towards the alley. So you're standing in the west wing of uh, the upper elementary reader uh, reading room, let's just call it. You're looking through the courtyard, through the maker space, that hedge wall is what's forming the boundary of the outdoor classrooms uh, outside of the maker space. To the left is the early childhood <coughs> library within the library. Again, completely visible from the circulation desk in all areas of the library, but it's glassed in, so it's acoustically sealed. It is an opportunity for us to invest a little bit of magic and wonder into the environment of the library. The library is probably one of the best opportunities for instilling a kind of lifelong commitment to learning. If they fall in love with the library, they'll be in love with it pretty much for a lifetime. <clears throat> One of the ways you really grab them is to make it a magical place, so we will make every effort to do so. This now is looking back at the historic garden on the left, kind of study bar, <clears throat> would have been known as a tech bar in the old days, but now it's just a place for students to study, relatively close to the circulation desk, so they can be properly uh, surveilled to the left of the, you know, are the collections. You're looking to the right now into the early childhood <coughs> room. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, with this mask on, I can lose my breath. These are the collections now that are in the north, uh, west, uh, southwest, southwest corner of the U. Uh, you can see across the uh, reading room into early childhood room on the left, and beyond you can see over to the project room and the maker space, and in the middle is the circulation desk. Uh, we are now in the, at the bottom of the U, so the one wing that faces out onto the historic garden is to the left, you see the circulation desk, we're now looking back at the auditorium, so we're looking this way. To the right is the maker space itself. Project room on the right, maker space on the left, the maker space, uh, and the out adjacent outdoor space. Again, opening out to make it continuous indoor outdoor spaces, and then finally back to the project room. Um, outdoor on the left, courtyard on the right. Thank you. Campus and look and see if there's any 
potential for hazardous material release due to construction activities. Um, aesthetics and, and other issues will also be addressed in the, in the CEQA document. Um, then, uh, once all that data has been gathered and we uh, are done with that, then they're going to prepare what's known as an initial study. Um, that will be released for a 30-day uh, public review sometime this early summer, most likely. Um, during that review period, there will be a meeting in here to discuss the findings of the initial study, as well as give an update as to where we are with the project and its design. Um, and then later, late fall, early winter, um, after the initial study has been um, uh, out there, they'll do the environmental impact report, which will uh, do a fuller accounting, describe any mitigation measures that must uh, uh, be implemented, uh, any significant impacts that might not be able to be mitigated to less than significant. Um, that will also be up for a 45 day public review period. There'll be another public meeting in here. And, uh, uh, during that time, any comments that are provided both in writing or at the, at the public meeting will be uh, uh, considered by the district and responded to. If any public agencies, such as like City Fire or Police Department, have any uh, comments that they sent to us, we will uh, then give them their, uh, our responses 10 days prior to the board adopting the, or certifying the, uh, the EIR and adopting the mitigation model. And that is the sequel step. I could go much deeper into it if anybody would like. I think for where we are right now. Yes. Who are the approving agencies the school board? The approving agency is the school board. It's the district's project, it's the district's funding. Um, so they, <laughs> they certify about the, the environmental impact report. So uh, is the school board who's requiring the EIR? It's it's the CEQA, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, requires that the school board undertake the, the evaluation. So that's... Yeah. Right. I have a question about uh, the scope of the, um, the what I'm saying the improvements So the environmental impact report is going to that's, a, that's an excellent question. The environmental impact report is going to look at the entirety of the master plan, so the, the projects that are uh, that Jim presented tonight. Um, we're going to have more information, obviously, about the first projects, the SMS projects, because they're designing those, so we'll be able to look at those a little bit more closely. But we're going to look at the rest of the projects at such a level that um, on, uh, when funding is procured, the district will be able to move forward with those with minimal SQL review. It's, it's a streamlining, um, which is allowed by the SQL. Thank you, Julian. Yeah. So what I'd say is what we've shown you so far is a 10 to 15 year uh, plan. Uh, as we said, the first projects, the SMS projects, we hope to get into construction next June, June of 23. Uh, Depending on when we go for additional funding, there's probably another bond, most yeah. likely in 24. I'd hope to start the next project, which would be this, the single story with the garden on top, as early as 2025. Uh, so it's not, it's, not five, it's not six years out, seven years. It's closer than that. Uh, the, the following building would come a little later, and we, we have to really sort of also see how we're doing and where we're going and what uh, our enrollment is because that's very much uh, part of our, you know, our mix. Uh, we are, this school has not gone down in enrollment as much as some schools. Um, this area is still a little more robust. Also, one of, one of the big questions is what happens with the uh, city's uh, regional housing numbers, because you know, the state has said you need to add 9,000 units uh, somewhere in Santa Monica, and some of them might be near here, and those might come with children. Uh, we, you know, and the TK adds a whole other grade, which is a whole other group of children. So as we're going down, we might be going up, and then don't even talk about what might happen at the airport. So how that will impact Grant and other schools in this area. So those are the things we're looking at as far as sort of numbers and where we're going. But it's now time for you to talk. What's your questions you have? You'll see those on our district uh, website. It's a lovely 150 page document and uh, very, it's really, really a wonderful thing, but it is aspirational. It's sort of saying, if we could do everything we wanted and we could create the perfect spaces for our kids right this moment, that's where we'd go. 
we deal a little more with reality, uh, and, and you know we have what we have, and we also have we don't have the ability, funding or time or you know to say, hey kids, go away for three years, and we're going to take the campus and change it to be you know perfect for the day, what we imagine today. So we're going to be using our spaces, and slowly we'll be taking a look at. It. I do think that in some places we will go in and look at consolidating classrooms and taking two classrooms and making them into one and sort of creating those spaces. We're also looking at how we're enhancing our outdoor spaces and sort of making a better indoor outdoor so that we get space not by building but by allowing that engagement. Um, the great thing is, you know, we've spent most of Measure ES and parts of, of Measure SMS coming in and we've modernized all of these classrooms. I don't know if you saw that, it's like we've done, we've done our windows, our paint, our floor, our technology, the new furniture, air, air conditioning, fire alarms, accessibility. Uh, we've made the classrooms as good as we can make them. And with the expect expectation, they're going to be around and being used, each of them, for five, ten, forever. So if that's the case, I'm just trying to understand the math in terms of the trajectory in phase two and three, the new buildings, the one story, the, 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 the phase two building uh, has six classrooms. I, I think I'm answering your question. Can you finish it? Well, six classrooms that comparing the, the, the numbers, it's actually the numbers that are being So for phase two, we're putting in six classrooms and they've just replaced those six or four portals. For what I call phase three, which is the one that runs along the alley, that allows us to get rid of the four modular, modular classrooms and also potentially allows us to get rid of this front building here that sort of takes away from the core. So and it also is going to very much depend on where we are with enrollment and so, so I, I look at phase three as a, uh, a pressure valve that we can adjust based on where we are with education and enrollment. But we're not planning on really impacting the ones that are in the main historical. So the, the funds that are actually being spent for the TK and the consolidation, essentially, when it goes to phase three, that gets wiped out because you're leaving those buildings. Yes, but it's still down the road. So we, we have to do a little bit now to be ready for the later. So um, yeah, just my second question, maybe more of a question for Jim, mm -hmm. is the the six classroom building with the rooftop yeah. reads to me visually from here to the presentation as a two story building where we serve. I think that's a the comment is it reads the one story the one the one story building reads like a two story building. I think that is a true statement from the playground. Side because we have this covered porch mm -hmm. along the south side of, of the let's call it the second floor right. uh, because we have to get an elevator and two stairs up there because it's occupied. So in order to get students and teachers up there, you have to have two exits down plus the elevator. So um, that was really the reason for that, and then it creates shade and outdoor space. But this drawing is equally important because in the model, hopefully you can see in the model too, because it does step down to the one story as it approaches the historic right. floor. Yes. Other questions, thoughts, opinions? Oh my God, what were you thinking? Yes? I have a question about the second story also. I see stairs going up there. Is that correct? They're yes. open access. On the weekend, that is an open park, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering how that's going to be I, I see, I potentially see some issues we've had on weekends when there isn't as many people here, you know what I'm talking about. So I, I just want to make sure that that's a, a secured space yeah. with restrooms, with soccer games, and all of that factored in. Because right. that really, the space gets used and it does need to be kind of contained. I mean, it really is locked in now. Right. Um, so, have an opportunity. Yeah, well, for, I guess the first thing to say is, who knows if this building, if it will look like that yeah. two, two years from now when we actually get into design. Yeah. That's, so your input is heard, and uh, hopefully we'll be heard again. Yeah, I mean, I know um, we absolutely need that space, but it also... Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. That goes back to that list of issues that I yeah, have. Yeah. There's quite a few of them. I saw the drawing for the second story. Second story? Yeah, it's a kind of wall. I think it's kind of a wall. Walking on the wall here, the pool, wherever. They just seem to want to do that. You know, that's a lot of fault. Oh, sure. Well, we could certainly put a fence on top of it. We'll, we'll do something to make sure. I mean, yes, uh, we're very aware of uh, uh, the uh, adventurousness of students. I place that in the nicest way I can say that. Uh, and we will definitely be considering that, as we have with all our other constructions. Uh, we, you know, we keep checking to make sure that we're, you know, there's even a little space at John Adams with our new uh, music area. And we're still like, we're not quite the best thing we have to do for that. Yes, sir. Oh, you had your hand up a second ago. So oh, that's you. That's, that's you. Yeah. Okay, so this is actually a question for you. How is it, uh, the grant facility improvement plan for phase one slotted versus other things in the district? Question part A, and then part B is, where are the uh, points along the timeline where the schedule may slip, and what can this community do to ensure that doesn't happen? Great. Two good questions. So, uh, about a, a little more than a year ago, we uh, had finished our initial assessments, yes. and we uh, came up with a project list working very much with the principal and his team, mm -hmm. and then that went to the Facility District Advisory Committee, which is a set of appointed people by the, and they helped narrow it down. They did say that we, you know, we have about a hundred million to spend. We're saving back some of that for uh, escalation and other, you know, but so in that, the district, facility district advisory committee said, emphasize the five old elementary schools first, which is why Edison and University Match, which are newer campuses, didn't get anything in this one. And then we had to start balancing and trying to figure out what were the good first steps, what were the second. I mean, the uh, one-story building was very much in play, but we really couldn't do that new building and do four other new buildings. And so the, just as far as we felt like the, it was a decision, and it was supported by the Board Facility Subcommittee and the Board to say, Grant will get this, which might not be as much as sort of maybe, say, McKinley's getting this time, but we'll make sure that in the very next thing, Grant's in the front of the list. But the reason for my question is I want to understand, you know, are all these projects basically being sequenced at the same time? Between McKinley and Grant, and then is there a prioritization of the that's happening? Are they all happening concurrently? What's driving this? Guy? The original plan was to sort of do some starting one summer and some starting the other. We were hoping to get some of them starting this year and the others, but uh, COVID and our historic resources and others sort of delayed us. Okay. Uh, so the plan right now is we're probably going to try to kick all of them in summer of 23 and all five projects go. We'll go all at the same time. Yeah. Are you competing? Is that one general contract for the program a little bit? Or uh, we haven't decided that yet. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, just we're, just we're not there yet. Yeah. So when those decisions get made, are we done at the school board level? The, the, the final yes decision is all school board, okay. but along the way there's a lot of site meetings and discussions and then very much our department of facility improvements goes through a lot of those discussions and then the facility district advisory committee uh, also helps along the way. And we have three board members who are part of our board facility subcommittee. We meet with them a lot also right. and, they, and, they, uh, and they, they're brought on. Uh, Where I'm trying to get to is how can this community make sure that we don't miss Great. Right. Who do we uh, talk to? Who do we, how can we help? How do we drive this forward? This is good. A lot of that comes to when it comes to decisions for the board. And when we have those moments of decision coming up, we'll let uh, your principal know and he'll push that out. And we've already done that some where we've gotten people go out and you know, say, hey, it's coming. Now's the moment we need to show up. You know, now's the moment. And, and, um, and I have to say, it really is important that the parents show up and say, this is important. Education, our students, is important. Uh, there's a lot of um, other stakeholders who have a lot of different views and opinions in our community. Yes. Uh, you know, everyone, and everything from the don't do anything ever people to the, you know, other concerns. 
Uh, and we have to always balance it, but I, we, we work with our principal to let me know when those moments come. Right, the thing is that it's being constructed. Is we able yeah. to be talk, talking to the right people so it's going to where it matters most so we're not burning for sure with a bunch of people. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, and you know, and a, and a lot of that is also talk to your board members when you, when you see them. And, you know, and just say, hey, this really is important. Yeah, got you it. know, uh, this is something, you know, we want to have it happen. Yes. First of all, thank you all very much. We're very excited as parents here. Um, we love this school, um, but it definitely needs some modernization. So thank you. Um, I'm curious with the universal TK, if all of the other five elementary schools that you mentioned are all putting some of the budget dollars towards the TK program, or if they are not spending that, or you know choosing or have to or choosing to spend the TK, some money on TK here. Is that like a universal spend? Everybody's, everyone, yeah. Exactly. Everyone's going to get TK, every elementary school, and it's all going to come up around the same, you know, it, it builds over the next five years, so it might be that certain schools get TK a little earlier, and it might, because as we build it up, but yes, we're thinking about that. now. Where we are is we already have six TKs across the district. We also have preschools that we are going to, that are currently serving four-year-olds that are gonna transition into TKs. There's about eight of those. But then we have about six others that we are now planning to be building over the next three, four years that will actually help support that. And in some places, what we have to do is we have to go in and put in some restrooms and break out some walls. We have some smaller projects that we're planning and thinking about that we have to do to make sure we're ready for the onslaught of four-year-olds. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I have two questions, one of which just built on top of that, and another that's not related at all. So the first one is, what's happening to the preschool then? Is there any, will there not be preschool at this campus at all? Are there plans for, for early childhood before TK? Before, before yeah, first off, so so then preschool becomes three-year-olds as opposed to four-year-olds. We want to definitely have our four-year-olds on the campus and on the pathway. We're not sure how many places we're still going to have room for three-year-olds. But then we'll shift, because like at John Adams, we have threes and fours now. That will probably become much more of a three-year-old space. At Washington West, we'll become more of a three-year-old space. So. We're going to still have preschool in the district. It's just it, a lot of it becomes the, the TK. Right. Okay, thank you. And then totally separate question. Um, when you talk about the transition, you mentioned that you have the library project. You said you said next summer. Mm -hmm. right? um, approximately, how long is it? I know what the schedule is, but how long is it predicted for that to take? And then what are the plans? Because not what are the plans for the students while that's ongoing? And like what will they use as their library space and how will it not be disruptive to the learning experience for the kids right here? Great questions. So we think our construction on this is about 15 months? At the most. At the most. So we think that, you know, if we start summer of 23, we'll be definitely ready by fall of 25, mm -hmm. hopefully a lot sooner. And that's in the library. The other ones will go a little faster. We're already talking about how we, with, uh, with Christian, about how we swing that and how we still provide the library. We'll be taking over probably a couple of classroom spaces and sort of moving and thinking. We're, we're not yet, that's not fully baked, uh, but it is something we're very much talking about and we have to, we will solve it. Um, that there will still be library services and still that things, those things happen whenever we're in transition. Yes? visual access. 
access to the historic board campus. So it seems to me that that's maybe a question that you might have addressed in the early phases of master planning had there been an inventory that was informing your master planning process. And I just yes, we knew when we stepped on campus that what was the historic core and that we were not going to mess with it. So, frankly, the historic resources board has had zero influence on our strategy. Because we always knew what was in that blue boundary. We didn't know that there was a blue boundary, but we knew that this was this was an historic campus and that we needed to respect it. So, the Rogers is a different story, but this, this uh, campus for sure. We even knew that that front wing, you can see it immediately, that that front wing was not part of the original uh, building of, of the campus. So uh, I have to say with all honesty, it would not influence in any way any kind of change. Of yeah. I, we actually had to tell them to quit calling it historic until we actually had the study done. Um, but yes, we, we, already, we always knew and thought we'd be preserving a good, most of this already, and that's where we started. Um, we're hearing what you're saying. We are. We have. We have. At each of these campuses, gone through a re, you know, a, a reimagining and consideration of what we've seen in the historic. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do feel like if we had had it in most since in most cases, we probably would come up with some of the same solutions, only because that's the way it sort of works. Uh, I mean, particularly like at Rogers, we have, it's like, the more we think about it, it's like we pretty much would end up the same if we had gone, if, you know, if we had started with, this is going to be preserved. Uh, and, but we are asking that question, it is part of what we're doing, and that might change for the next phases too. I've taken you after six o'clock, I said I was going to get you out by six, and I haven't, but let's answer one or two more questions just to we finish. Yeah, just a quick one. Do you think like yield and I'd like it to be uh, between two and three is what I'm thinking, but that's going to really depend on funding and schedule and discussion. And I, I would like to have that, that be actually part of phase two, but that's that's me uh, and my projections. So it's going to depend a lot on the funding and where all that goes to. Yeah, because I think getting that done sooner is better. Yeah. Other questions, and then I can release you to your homes. Did you have something? Oh, I thought I could hand up. Yes, you. <laughs> okay, no? Very Every single hand. All right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for being here. We have recorded this. If you have any other notes or things you want to give up, please give up to Kelsey, who's helped it. Thank you all, y'all, who've made this happen. Uh, uh, there, this is a part of the process, so we'll be inviting you to other parts of the process. We will put these presentations up on our district website uh, with the PTA, and we need to do that again, or we need to have that type of experience. Because, as you might know, to walk it is to know. It's like, it, you know, you got to see it. And so we want people to be informed to have this conversation. Thank you very, very much again. Uh, just to say with the model, uh, I did ask Brian and he adapted it to the final look so that you can see the model and then we walked in it with the original look and see what the final look is. So if you take it in the more and more three-dimensional experience. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.